Let's see if it's ready to we'll get started. So we're going to uh, continue on with uh, Steve Kibbleson's second lecture uh, yeah. on electron phonon coupling problem. And he's going to tell us, um, we ended yesterday on two, um, two ways of looking at the strong coupling limit, which uh, gave us kind of conflicting results. And he will tell us about you know, what an exact solution with Monte Carlo looks like. All right, let's welcome Steve. So, uh, right, so the, the puzzle we left with at the end of yesterday was that so long as E theorem e over omega naught, what? Oh, if you use the chubby chalk, I think it's more visible than that, that, that chalk. Okay. okay. solution from the two perspectives is similar to each other. So the question that we want to ask is what happens <coughs> when lambda is of order one. Um, now, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, studies that we've done of this problem, solving it by quantum Monte Carlo. And so let me just talk a little bit about how, at least I want to think about this quantum Monte Carlo approach to the problem. So I think we should think about this as being an experiment. Uh, if I get answers out of the quantum Monte Carlo, I'm doing measurements, it doesn't mean I understand anything. Uh, and, uh, but on the other hand, I know it's right, it doesn't have to do with some approximation I've made. Uh, but why would we then bother to do Monte Carlo experiments when there are lots of physical experiments? And so there are a few advantages of this. One is that we know what the bare parameters are in our problem. So if what we want to do is to ask about the accuracy of our theoretical understanding, we can make a comparison between theory and experiment without any adjustable parameters, because we know exactly what the parameters are. Um, the experimental system that we're studying is relatively simple, and that again makes comparison with theory more straightforward. Um, and there are no confounding effects, so when we look at Real experiments, we might ask, uh, are some of the results due to the fact that there's disorder in the problem? Okay, in our Monte Carlo problems, I can tell you that nothing that we're seeing is due to disorder because there's no disorder in the problem. You might want to ask, maybe in a real experiment, uh, it's not all due to electron phonon interactions, maybe magnetism is playing. Okay, I can promise you that in our numerical experiments, magnetism is not playing a role because there's no magnetism. So it has a great deal of advantages if what your goal is is to make a direct test of your theoretical understanding. The flip side of that is that you should not think that this is a way of making predictions about 
real experimental systems. In fact, it's a very awkward way to go about doing that because I can't easily ask what happens as I change this parameter or that parameter because changing a parameter involves doing a whole new calculation. But even worse, what we're going to do is we're going to make, take advantage of the fact that the electron phonon problem is a particularly easy problem from the Monte Carlo point of view because although a generic problem of interacting uh, fermions has the famous minus sign problem, the problem of the electron phonon uh, coupled electron phonon problem has no minus sign problem. It's still hard. We have to, this is called determinantal quantum Monte Carlo, and so we have to pay the price that we have to calculate lots of determinants. People have developed extremely good ways of doing this and efficient update algorithms, but still uh, calculating determinants is hard work. Um, and uh, we are interested in a problem where uh, the phonon frequency is much smaller than the Fermi energy. So we already have a small parameter in the problem. We would like to get to temperatures that are even smaller than the phonon frequency. So we're going to have to work hard to get to low enough temperatures that we're going to see interesting things. So it's not that it's easy. But because we don't have minus sign problems, it's relatively easy. But by the same token, many of the questions you might like to ask, like, well, what happens if I turn on a little bit of repulsive interactions, are problems we simply can't address. The moment we turn these on, we have minus sign problems. So there are a lot of shortcomings of relying on these uh, Monte Carlo experiments. You have a question? Okay. Uh, why are you interested in the lambda? Like of order one because the conflict was in the strong lambda limit. So why are you looking at the lambda order one? So um, so for lambda of order one, well, okay. So that's at the edge of this regime. I mean, it, what I'm going to find is that this migdal ashberg theory is going to break down when lambda is of order one. But you know, uh, these are notional uh, uh, values. I mean. Uh, Okay. Uh, all right, good. So, um, well, here's where I was going to use the blackboard, but instead you're going to have to use your memory. So, uh, let me tell you what problem we're going to solve. So our model is going to be the so-called Holstein model. And this is, I think, the simplest model of the electron phonon problem that you can study. It's to the electron phonon problem as the Hubbard model is to the electron-electron problem. And so what we have is the Hamiltonian. It's a band structure piece phonon piece and an electron phonon couple. This will be of the form of the Hamiltonian that we discussed yesterday, but I will make specific simplifications. So the band structure is some type binding Hamiltonian, I have a spin a half, this sums over spin up and spin down, and we're going to take, uh, let's go call that T, the nearest neighbor hopping, which will set my units of energy, so we'll take that to be one, and we'll take the second neighbor hopping equals minus 0.3. That happens to be the value that people use to have a, ah, good. So this way, at least, you can remember. It will remember. fit your Hamiltonian. Swing it around. Oh, yeah. Probably you want to push this. That's OK. OK, 
Okay, I just thought that having the Hamiltonian up here when I'm showing things later might be helpful. Okay, so we'll have here a stable hopping t equals 1. We'll have t prime equals minus 0 0.3. This is a totally random number, but it happens to be what reproduces the band structure of the coup rates. So it's in my mind, but the only reason to turn on a second neighbor hopping at all is that without a second neighbor hopping, the Fermi surface at half filling is perfectly nested, and there are peculiarities of that. So this is just to have a, a band structure that doesn't have any particular nesting. And we're also going to look We've done calculations for a range of electron concentrations, but everything that I'm going to show you today will be for one concentration, which is 0 0.8, which isn't anything in particular either. So uh, the, uh, the idea of this is to have some band structure that's not particularly exciting. So the phonon piece of the Hamiltonian is just going to be that of a dispersionless optical phonon. So it will be so we have a bare phonon dispersion relation which is no dispersion. <clears throat> so the bare phonon frequency is square root of k over m. And uh, this, uh, actually, that's not quite right. It turns out for these particular values, the Fermi energy is 1.7. Yes? Yeah, uh, I have two questions. One is to get a sense of overall energy scale. So it's one of the order of one electron volt for the cuprates? Or what are the units? But this isn't the cuprates. But it's, uh, I mean, one is, uh, uh, so in a typical metal, yeah, one will be on the order of an electron volt. And the second question was this n bar uh, is pointed, uh, so in your notation, is 1 equal to half filling? Yes, that's right. Okay. So this means 0.8 of an electron per site. Okay. Uh, so the total filled band will have two electrons per site. <coughs> and you're in 2 or 3D? So we're going to work on a square lattice in two dimensions. Uh, and that's another good question. I would nothing. I don't believe that anything I'm telling you is particularly dimension specific. But we have to pay a very big price to go up from two dimensions to three dimensions. Um, right. And so we're going to take omega naught over E F equals ten. Okay. So this is this is our version of a number that's much smaller than one. And again, I don't really think this number matters that much as long as it's small. But since we're doing you know, actual <laughs> numerical calculations, I want to tell you what we're actually doing. Good. And then the electron phonon coupling is alpha times sum over j of mj times xj. So just the most local electron phonon coupling we can have. The, uh, as the optic monon phonon mode distorts, it changes the energy of the electron on the site. And so we can define our bare electron phonon <coughs> coupling constant, which I'll call lambda naught, is alpha squared over k times the bare density of states at the Fermi surface. And we're going to study this in the range 
0 to 0 0.6. Things get very sticky as lambda naught gets big, and so it also starts getting hard to go to much larger lambda than that. All right, good. Um, let's see, let me just show you a picture briefly. Is that the same lambda as the lambda being one to two in the real materials? No, so the lambda that was between one and two was a measured lambda, so that's a renormalized, renormalized lambda. lambda star. Um, and uh, I will discuss that briefly. Uh, I mean, shortly, not briefly. I don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Any problems here? I can't get it to, I have to type in my password. So. No, that's not the problem I'm getting. I'm not getting the screen. surface looks like, so you'll believe me that it's not very nested. Um, uh, it has some, uh, some value of 2kf. We're going to talk about charge density waves later on. When people talk about charge density waves, they always immediately think about chiral instabilities and nesting vectors and things like that. Um, uh, I'll be quite explicit about that, but this being a two-dimensional system, there's a very good approximation for the, um, for the charge density wave susceptibility, that is to say the particle hole susceptibility, which is that this is equal to a constant which is its value for a circular Fermi surface. So uh, when people look at Fermi surfaces and see points where they're nested, they tend to get very excited. But I promise you that if you actually calculate the particle hole susceptibility for even Fermi surfaces that you think are very nested, that you'll find that it's constant. Um, the superconducting susceptibility, of course, the bare superconducting susceptibility. Uh, T. This is a cube equals zero, as usual, shows the usual Cooper instability. It diverges as the temperature tends to zero. Uh, there is something that we're going to look at, uh, which is something that you might have, did you have a question? No. That you normally wouldn't think is interesting at all, but is a very good diagnostic of whether we're in a strong or weak coupling limit. And that's the following. I'm going to look at the expectation value of the block state at k equals zero. This is the state at the bottom of the band. That is to say, twice the expectation value of CK 
sorry, C0, C0, which in the non-interacting limit is twice the Fermi function. And since we're going to go down to temperatures that are, say, a 30th of the Fermi energy, this is going to be equal to 2 to corrections of 1 part in 10 to the 13th. Okay? Now, this is something that is deeply taken to be equal to un an uninteresting number whenever you do any sort of perturbative or even resummation of perturbation theory approach to the problem. You write down some effective field theory, you take the cutoff of that field theory to go to infinity, and what you're saying there is you're saying, however the degrees of freedom near the Fermi energy rearrange, which might be highly non-perturbative, but I believe that the states deep below the Fermi surface are really unaffected by the interesting <coughs> physics that's going on. So this is a quantity that I'm going to compute in the Monte Carlo, but that you would expect to do nothing at all. Uh, right. Good. Um, all right, so we're going to do determinantal quantum Monte Carlo on this. Uh, we're going to go down to temperatures <coughs> e Fermi over 30. We're going to look at systems up to 12 by 12. Down to this temperature, the quantities that we compute are independent of system size at this size system, so this is big enough. Um, Going to lower temperatures is hard. I'm sure that there are Monte Carlo pros who can do it, and that might be worth it at some point in the future. But for now, what I would like you to take it with on faith is that I'm going to give you exact results for all thermodynamic properties of this system, effectively in the thermodynamic limit, down to this temperature. One other technical aside, I'm going to compare the results of the Monte Carlo calculations to the results of the migdal eliashberg theory. The migdal eliashberg theory will be evaluated on exactly the same size system. So it will, will solve the self-consistency equations exactly numerically for exactly the same size system. So the comparison between theory and experiment is uh, without any caveats. Um, good. Uh, ah, yes. So one other thing I should say is that Monte Carlo gives us data in imaginary time. So I'm going to also solve the big Dolly Ashberg theory in imaginary time, and so compare things as a function of Matsubara frequency <coughs> to things that are calculated as a function of Matsubara frequency. There is, uh, uh, of course, many interesting things you might like to know about what happens in real time and real frequency, things like conductivities require analytic continuations to, uh, to real time. But since my interest here is in understanding the validity of different theories, I'm never going to deal with analytic continuation. So whatever worries you have about analytic continuation, those are why I'm not talking about certain things, but they're not something that I'm hiding. All right, so there's the uh, migdal eli ashberg theory, and the quantities that we compute are the electron self-energy as a function of K and Matsubara frequency, the phonon free energy as a function of K and Matsubara frequency. Um, these are defined in the usual way, but the one that I'll, let me 
at least show it's a little bit just a slightly different normalization than I used. Uh, sorry, we win. So uh, it's just conventional to put a factor of two omega naught in the denominator in this def definition. And I'll talk about a renormalized phonon frequency, which I will obtain by taking um, uh, uh, this denominator evaluated at zero frequency. So uh, this will be D inverse of Q and nu n equals zero, and then times two omega naught. And that's a measure of the renormalized phonon frequencies. So So that's the normalized phonon frequency, which I can measure. And then regarding Michael's question, there is something that's called lambda, which is a renormalized version of the electron phonon uh, coupling constant. For historical reasons, people just call this alpha squared f of omega. It's this quantity. It can be extracted from tunneling measurements in real experiments. And here, this is equal to minus lambda naught times omega naught over 2 times d of k minus k prime and 0, where k and k prime are averaged around the Fermi surface. So this is a renormalized version of lambda naught. Um, so I will try to report to you results. I mean, since we're doing calculations where we set values with the bare parameters, I will describe the results in terms of lambda naughts and omega naughts. But we will also compute the renormalized values of lambda and the renormalized values of the phonon frequencies. Um, good. So now I really do want to go onto the screen. So let's see if I can do so. <laughs> that looks ugly. Nope. This is Cornell. That looks like the right one. Good. Uh, just, uh, just for historical interest, this is the uh, Big Doll paper, which uh, the uh, method is developed, which enables one to obtain electron energy spectrum 
and dispersion of the lattice vibrations without assuming that the interaction between the electrons and phonons is small. That's a clear and strong statement. Um, OK, so uh, first, here's, uh, here's the Fermi surface for the problem that I happen to be talking about. This is the first Brioan zone centered on the gamma point. Here, just shift it over to have it centered on the pi pi point. Um, uh, if you were to look for a nesting vector, you might pick this out. So uh, when we do calculations, you might want to look to see if anything is happening at the best nesting vector. But in fact, if you calculate the particle hole susceptibility to this, as I said, it's more or less a constant. So now we run our Monte Carlo calculations, and what do we find? Well, so here's, um, it's not a pointer or anything, is there? I have a pointer. Oh. Thank you. Uh, good. So this is the electron self-energy evaluated at two points on the Fermi surface, one near the diagonal, one near the um, the uh, zone edge. The dashed lines are computed from migdal Eliashberg theory. The solid lines are what come from the determinantal quantum from Monte Carlo. Uh, you can see that for lambda naught equals 0.2, they really agree really perfectly. Um, for lambda naught equals 0.4, uh, you can see deviations, but certainly it's a very impressive uh, uh, agreement. You know, if I were just to estimate based on 0.4, then I might have expected 40% errors in these things from perturbation theory, that we're certainly doing very much better than that. And then here at lambda naught equals 0.5, you can see that there is quite a significant breakdown. There's a factor of two or three difference between the imaginary part of the self-energy is computed with McDowell Lee Ashberg and that that comes out of the quantum Monte Carlo. Sir, what's the difference between the square? What? What's the difference between the square points and the like circle, the dots? So these, the circles are calculated from the quantum Monte Carlo, so these are exact. And the squares are calculated from migdal the Ashford theory. Um, no. It's like solid lines versus dashed line. Uh, What's the circle versus square? Oh, it's like it's a Wait, sorry, what's the question? The difference between the squares and the dots. I mean, what you said. Oh, so, is that so like one squares. is along the diagonal. So the, the orange are along the diagonal, and the greens are along this direction. We are on the Fermi surface here. Uh, we're not going to, 0.5 is really, the difference between 0.4 and 0.5 is what we're going to focus on. But just to give you a glimpse of what happens if we turn up lambda naught even more, here's when we go up to lambda naught equals 0.6. And now, so again, the dash or the migdal the Ashford theory, the solid symbols are the uh, quantum Monte Carlo. So now, not only is the size of the self-energy uh, totally different from what you get from McDonnell Ashford theory, but there is both a significant frequency dependence and a significant Q dependence, which are simply missing in the McDonnell Ashford theory. All right, here's the what happens to the phonon spectrum. So again, the dashed symbols are computed from McDowell the Ashford theory. The solid symbols are from quantum Monte Carlo. At lambda naught equals 0.2. So first place, at lambda naught equals 0, of course, this phonon has energy 1. So you see that as you turn up the electron-phonon coupling, you get some softening of the phonons. And that softening is more or less uniform across the Brioan zone. Yes? You didn't define your capital omega as a pole. 
it was just uh... right. So I'm in imaginary time. I, so I can't. I mean, you might have liked to have analytically continued in the, in the real part of the poll. I wanted something that didn't involve analytic continuity. And, and is it fair to ask, in physical sort of lattice units, what the RMS distortion of the atomic position is? Yeah, that's completely fair. Uh, we haven't calculated it. It's easy to calculate. We should calculate it. Because there's some bound of a few percent when, when empirically things melt. Melt, yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I suspect it's quite small because we still have small phonon frequencies, but uh, we haven't calculated it, so I can't answer your question. Um, Okay, so here's lamb. Here's lambda naught equals 0.4. Uh, we see considerably more softening. We also start seeing some significant k dependence of the softening. We see that the mode is becoming softest right near the end point, which is pi pi. And we see the first minor di discrepancy between the quantum Monte Carlo and the migdal ashford theory. Remember, at lambda naught equals 0.4, things are still working pretty well. But what you see is that the migdal ashford theory sort of is trying to tell you that maybe something's going soft at this nesting wave vector, because the migdal ashford theory is really obsessed with Fermi surfaces. But the Monte Carlo is definitely telling you that what's going soft is something right at the commensurate wave vector pi pi, which is not a nesting vector of the Fermi surface at all. And then when we go to lambda naught equals 0.5, we find very large deviations in the, uh, in the uh, degree of softening. Notice that, I mean, you know, the general shape isn't all that different, but this is a factor of two and a half uh, in the phonon frequency here. Um, and again, the shape of the softening is quite different. So we're seeing some real tendency towards a charge density wave and a commensurate wave vector emerging as we're turning up this strong coupling. And while migdal ashford theory has some inclination that this is going on, it gets the details of this charge density wave instability really quite wrong. Uh, again, just to show you that this gets worse as we go to lambda naught equals 0.6. Uh, here, it's uh, very clear that this is a uh, centered and commensurate wave vector. OK, what about superconductivity? So this is, I think, in some ways, the most dramatic picture I have to show you. So again, the solid points are uh, computed from Monte Carlo. And now the solid lines are computed from migdal ashford theory. So what you see is that lambda naught equals 0.4. The superconducting susceptibility grows as you lower the temperature. And migdal ashford theory is bang on. It really, really works. All of this, this ideology actually, I mean, to me, it's astonishing how well it works. And then, like falling off a wall, we turn up the lambda naught equals 0.5, and suddenly it doesn't work at all anymore. Not only is it quantitatively wrong, but it's totally qualitatively wrong. It says that the migdal ashford theory says the superconducting susceptibility is growing as we lower the temperature, clearly indicating that we're approaching a superconducting transition at low temperature, whereas the exact results show the superconducting susceptibility is dying. Uh, OK, it gets worse at lambda equals 0.6. Um, here's, here's the superconducting susceptibility at our lowest temperature as a function of lambda naught. And again, the solid line is migdal ashford theory. 
and the dots are the quantum Monte Carlo. And so you can see right at lambda naught equals 0.4, something very sudden goes wrong. Up here are the renormalized values of lambda. And what you see is not unexpected, that what's going on is that lambda we can think of as being of the same structure as here, but k is now the softened phonon uh, stiffness. So as the phonons get softer, the, uh, the renormalized value of lambda gets bigger. At this point, lambda naught equals 0.4 corresponds to lambda of 1.7. Lambda naught of 0.5 corresponds to lambda of 4.6. OK, so it's clear that something sudden happens here. We still have that lambda naught times the bare phonon frequency or lambda times the renormalized phonon frequency is much smaller than 1. So according to migdal ali ashberg theory, everything should be fine. In fact, if we take our uh, our measured electron propagator and measured phonon propagator and calculate what a vertex uh, correction would be with those, we get a small number. But something is going very wrong. And here's a clue of what's going wrong. So this is what I mentioned. This is the occupancy of the state at the band bottom. So I've normalized this in a funny way. First place, this is 2 minus the occupancy of the state at the band bottom. So in the non-interacting limit, this is 2. So uh, I've done it so that it, for lambda naught equals 0, the, uh, this quantity is 0. And deviations from 0 are telling me, us about how much electrons are being knocked out of this band bottom state, yes? On the previous slide, though, is there a momentum space differentiation of the two phenomena? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I mean, this is at q equals zero. This is the superconducting susceptibility. But nevertheless, I mean, you showed that the softening, the softening of the electron phonon coupling right. is at a particular point in momentum. Well, no, it's the whole. I mean, it's strongest at a particular point. So you know. What, I mean, as you know, for, for superconductivity, it's phonons of integrated over a broad range of Q that contribute to the effect of lambda. But so, you know, what you can see here is that, uh, OK, the softest phonons here, um, the softest phonons here are maybe softened by a, a factor of 10. But the average phonon frequency is renormalized by maybe a factor of four. Um, and if you calculate according to migdal ali ashberg theory, that is to say the appropriate average of this over the Fermi surface, you find that this is about a factor of four or five soft. But yeah, there is case-based structure. You're, you're right about that. So Steve? Yeah. Uh, when you do the Migdal at Eli Ashberg, uh, do you also uh, self-consistently move the chemical potential? Yes. OK. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is all at fixed uh, particle density. OK. Good. Um, so then I've normalized this axis as follows. If we went to the very strong coupling polaronic regime, well, then there's no k-space structure. So then the average occupancy of any k-space state is just the same as any other k-space state. So this would be the density, which in this case is 0.8. So I've normalized this so that in the polaronic limit, this should be 1. And in the non-interacting limit, it should be 0. The dashed line here is this quantity computed with migdal ashberg theory. And what you see is that it's both very small. There's very small deviations in the state infinitely far from the band 
at, from the Fermi energy, and it's a smooth function of lambda, but the Monte Carlo is showing a sudden deviation from this at lambda equals 0.4. This is the difference between the Monte Carlo data and the uh, migdal ashberg data. And so there's starting to be a rearrangement of the spectrum that's not just focused on the Fermi energy, but is over the whole band. Um, so this maybe is some of the case space structure that you want in Seamus. This is the charge density wave susceptibility for lambda naught equals 0.4 at different values of Q. So away from just at some random value of Q, I don't know, pi zero, <coughs> the migdal ashberg theory and the uh, exact results get the same answer, which is that nothing interesting is happening. But as you go close to this ordering vector pi pi, first place, the Monte Carlo gives a much stronger uh, uh, peak at pi pi than the migdal ashberg And in fact, as you see, the migdal ashberg thinks that the peak is at a different ordering vector. OK, so good. So that's, that's the results. Okay, now I'm going to do some interpretation and some speculation and some extrapolation. So first place, what's going on here? Good. So first place, this is as low as temperature as we were able to go. And, um, and well, um, I did 1.6, I went to 0.5. You know, we're well above the superconducting TC. These numbers are still not large. So we want some way of extrapolating to figure out what TC is. So here's what we say. If in the range of temperatures that we look at, big Dalli ashberg theory works, then we'll use big Dalli ashberg theory to compute TC. And we believe that's probably a pretty good estimate of TC. That's how we extrapolate this data to low temperatures. Here, where migdal ashberg theory doesn't work, we can't use that procedure. But here, we say TC is probably 0, because the susceptibility is dropping. So here's what migdal ashberg theory says for TC. It gives us a TC that's rising until we hit lambda equals 0.4. Actually, then it gets quenched because uh, migdal ashberg theory says there's a charge density wave that comes on at that point. But all of this is at very low temperatures. None of these ordered states are affecting what we're seeing because our lowest temperatures are 0.05, so off the top of this curve. Um, good. Um, so, um, so, so, Steve, your conclusion is you trust the part where I trust everything to the left of this line. Okay. So the drop is not just That's in the regime where migdal ashberg theory is already broken down at high temperature. So there's no reason to trust any of that. In fact, there's no reason to trust anything to the right of that blue line. I just show you what the solution is just for completeness. But I know for sure that everything to the right of that line is wrong. OK, I don't know for sure that everything to the left of that line is right. It could be that big Dalli ashberg theory breaks down at lower temperatures, but at least I have no reason to doubt big Dalli ashberg theory to the left of that line. Um, um, what was I going to say? Ah, yes. So now let's think about the physics of TC. So, um, right, so TC is going to be. Well, its scale is going to be set by a phonon frequency. Uh, 
take your pick whether you want it to be the bare phonon frequency. Let's take it to be some average of the renormalized phonon frequency. And then times a dimensionless function of the various dimensionless parameters in our problem. Omega bar over EF, lambda, uh, mu star, whatever. OK, so this is not much of an assumption. <laughs> and now, now I want to think about things. So first place, we're interested in the case where things are very highly retarded. So I want to evaluate this in the limit that this quantity goes to 0. And similarly, I imagine that all of the ideology about mu star is right. So we can ignore the dependence on mu star. And well, dot, dot, dot is details of band structure and so on. And I hope I don't have to worry about that. And that leaves me then with the idea that Tc is a phonon frequency times a function of the dimensionless electron phonon coupling. And now, this is true in migdal ashford theory as well. But what we see is, as long as there isn't another instability in the problem, what everybody finds is that this is a monotonically increasing function of lambda. And what we've now found is that there is an optimal value of lambda, and this is maximized when lambda is equal to that value. So what we conjecture is that there, there's a value of lambda, which for our particular Holstein model is 1.7 if we look at the renormalized lambda. And the TC should be optimized there. And that means that if we believe that, then TC should always be smaller than omega bar times A of lambda star. And for the Holstein model, we find that A of lambda star is about 0 0.12. And so since I don't want us to take things too seriously. We'll take A equals 1 tenth. OK, so we have a conjecture here. I'm now going to try to make connection with real experiment. My conjecture is that there's an upper bound on the superconducting TC, which is given by 1 tenth of the average phonon frequency. OK, and this is well beyond McDowell Ashford theory. The, OK, so we gather together data. Now, what's the average phonon frequency? OK, that's anybody's guess. But at least I want to have something unambiguous. So there's data that reports on the body temperature of these systems, which is some estimate of what the, the upper bound on the phonon spectrum is. So this is an experimentally measured quantity. And so this is various materials, TC versus theta Debye. And so the first thing you see is that everything is below this line, which is good. If it was supposed to be a bound, it would be embarrassing if anything was above the line. On the other hand, I could have drawn the line that TC is less than 10 times the Fermi energy, which would also be satisfied, but would be totally useless bound. But what you see here is that all sorts of good superconductors are sort of pushing up against this bound. And so I think that sort of suggests that this bound is not only some rough bound, but actually a useful guide to how high you can get TC. Um, so um, um, Steve, where's MGB2 on that? So MGB2 is over here. And, but in MGB2, the, the, the Debye temperature is 884 Kelvin. Four. And so TC over theta Debye is 0.04. So uh, it's about a factor of two below this band. But where the numerology gets really fun, this is Michael's question from yesterday, is if we look up, no, maybe it was Una's question from yesterday. We look up H3S at 155 gigapascals, 
it has a TC of 203 Kelvin. Now, we don't know what the Dubai is for it because it hasn't been measured under pressure, but there are DFT calculations of the phonon dispersion, and it's some whole mess of spaghetti, and I don't understand it, but what I can do is I can look at the DFT and see at least what's the highest frequency phonon, which is 0.23 EV. So TC over that is 0.08. So that's almost the same ratio as for lead. All right, good. So um, what about buckyball? So buckyballs, um, I mean, buckyballs satisfy this, but buckyballs are in a different regime because there, the, pho the phonon frequency is bigger than the bandwidth. And so uh, I, I'm not sure I want to put buckyballs on this. Um, right. Um, so there were other things I was going to say about charge density waves, but I think I'm at my end of my time, so I'll stop there. Uh, looks like barium bismuthate is the closest to your bound. So, is there anything special or something to learn about uh, this mechanism? From yeah. Bacteria? So, barium bismuthate, it, barium it, bismuthate actually looks like it's really on this crossover between weak and strong coupling. So, there's uh, some ideas that you have uh, really negative U centers here. You have some sort of pairing that transcends TC. It's also in very close proximity to a charge density wave. So it really does appear to be actually at some bound where if, if, um, if one were to turn up the coupling, one or another nasty thing would go wrong. But anyway, uh, I agree with you that it suggests that going back and looking at uh, Barium bismuthate is a is a good idea. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe you explained that, but I missed it. But what is the assumption that breaks down in Migdal's theorem, or like the derivation in that paper that makes this thing don't? I mean, it doesn't work. What if right. it goes wrong? What? So yeah. So so what's wrong is field theory. So. The whole approach is based on starting from a vacuum in which the states deep below the Fermi surface are filled and the states deep far above the Fermi surface are empty. And in which, OK, we're going to do whatever clever things we can do to, uh, to solve the problem, but we're not going to worry about that. Now, you know, there is something probably sharper going on here. What it sort of looks like, what in a sense the overlapping ranges of validity suggests is that the underlying drama is some sort of first order transition. That, um, I mean, we're at too high temperatures to see it, but my guess is that what happens is that at lower temperature there's a first order transition. Which means that as you approach the first order transition from one side, you don't have a clue that anything's going wrong. Everything's going nicely, and then suddenly it's a new vacuum, and it's a new story, and it's new sets of degrees of freedom. Okay, but uh, that's, uh, I mean, we're working on that, but that's, uh, 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 it's nothing internal that's going wrong. If you, if you calculate corrections, everything looks good. So then generically, does this picture predict that whenever you engineer a material and approach the maximum or attempt to pass through the maximum TC that you predict, that we're going to find a commensurate charge density wave on the other side? So it, what it means is that you're going to definitely find charge localization of one sort or another. So um, the part I didn't get to was about charge density waves. So in this particular problem, we're on a bipartite lattice. So the moment I tell you, look, I'm going to have some classical lattice gas where 
sites are either doubly occupied or unoccupied. All right, then I have an Ising antiferromagnet, and you know, it's nothing to do with the Fermi surface, it's due to the lattice structure. We get pi pi ordering and phase separation and whatever. But I could have engineered things so that there was lots of frustration in that problem, in which case the ordering temperature would be much suppressed and be very complicated, but I would still get this transition to this bipolaronic physics. I think that's the more primitive thing. But once you're in that limit, once you're in the strong coupling limit, then commensurate CDWs are the only things you're going to find. Uh, you know, they might be simpler or, or more complicated. Uh, okay, that's too strong a statement. You can get in commensurate things if you have sufficiently complicated interactions. So I'm still a little confused about this bound. In your migdal ali ashberg approach, you had a, it looks still like a bound that the that above about lambda naught equals 0.4, the uh, CW did. So that the was due to. Is different. No, no, no. But that was. So the point is there, the, the superconductivity was cut off by the existence of a new broken symmetry state. Uh -huh. Okay, This is a bound that has nothing to do with the advent of a broken symmetry state. So we see this downturn of the superconducting susceptibility at high temperatures where there's no other broken symmetries. This is just a breakdown of the migdal ali ashberg theory. It has nothing to do with the downturn there, which is due to, I mean, that's due to competing orders, which is a real effect, but it's not the right effect for this model. Now, you may ask, why was it that the maximum value occurred just at the place where the migdal ali ashberg theory it's causes? Like I'm getting confused about what? it. What? I'm getting confused yeah. about So I, I would like to think that that's an accident we're working on slightly different band structures. Our preliminary results show that that's just an accident, that, that those two things get separated. But that is confusing. But the main thing is I would like you to just ignore migdal ali ashberg theory to the right of that blue line, where we know it's totally wrong. So Cooper rates actually do violate this bound, right? I mean, they're, they're not. Electron photon superconductors. They're not electron photon superconductors, but I doubt do they violate this bound. What's the I mean, mercury cuprate is 150 Kelvin TC. It doesn't have a thousand five hundred Kelvin divide temperature. It might. I mean the optical phonon the pho oxygen phonons are at pretty high temperature. Okay, so that's a question then. Do, does anything violate this? Um I mean, look, I, it's sort of irrelevant whether it does or not, because it's not an electron phonon mechanism. But um what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or if I take it to bo if I use some other energy scale, like you know, people play these games, right? Electron whatever coupling. No. So, so um, exactly. people have tried to compare it to e Fermi, for instance, yeah. which is different physics. Um, but anyway, yeah. The first question: Does anything violate this? Like, so, at least we've looked through things that people think are conventional electron phonon superconductors and have not not found any violators of it. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, that's a, uh, you know, that's a, a challenge. And probably the best way to look for things is to look for things with relatively low to buy temperatures that have anomalously high TCs. So I have a question. The, uh, the Fermi theory is calculations, Raphael, and Eris, Yeah. Uh, uh, the Haspel model, yeah. they found the no violation of Miguel Lieschberg to their disappointment. Well, that the second statement the authors were, I think, somewhat divided on. Them. They were okay. ecstatic were or disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> there was a polarization. Okay, some of them were disappointed. Okay, so uh, why, what, what's the difference? Why, why, why Miguel Lieschberg find there? So I don't know. Because it's from the beginning, very much like Fermi surface based starting point? I don't, so I don't know what the answer to that. That's a much more complicated problem mm -hmm. with many more moving parts in it. But I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, it doesn't have the same. So it definitely has very different strong coupling physics here. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here is not somehow an organic something that's organically wrong about Migdal-Ali-Ashberg theory, but, but just a change in the vacuum. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Steve.